whenever you say a society is all about X, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, societies are just, they're richly complex and all these things have different roles to play and they're both good and bad and so on. But I think that style of thinking, which you see today, is, is very Marxist, too. Yeah. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the Senior Publishing Director. Today, we kick off a new series of discussions looking at four massively influential figures who together help explain our current moment, how we arrived where we are today. The first one is Karl Marx, the famous German philosopher and economist. And here to help unpack the person and the thought of Marx is Bishop Barron. Bishop, good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Always a joy to be with you. Before we get to Marx, let's talk about your latest comings and goings. You recently journeyed to Atchison, Kansas, where you mm. visited the great Benedictine College and also received the Beauty and Culture Award. Tell us a little bit about that visit. Oh, I love that visit. It was wonderful. It's a great um, small Catholic college with a very strong sense of Catholic identity. Kids were marvelous. I, I met a lot of the faculty. Spent a lot of time with them. They, they got their money's worth in a way because I was kind of going – all day, but I loved it. Loved every moment of it. My favorite, I, I um, gave the commencement address, but my favorite moment really was this um, uh, award from the uh, Center for Beauty and Culture, which is run by my good friend, Dr. Dennis McNamara, whom I've known from Mundelein years ago. And um, just an opportunity to address this issue of, of beauty and the role that's played in my own work. But I'll tell you, the, um, the award they gave me is one of the best things I've ever gotten in my life. It was a hand-painted on vellum, the, the, the style of the Middle Ages, this sort of illuminated manuscript, basically. And it was a, it was a bit of the story in Latin of the non te, you know, the story of Aquinas hearing the voice from the cross and what would you have as a reward? And Thomas said, I'll have only you. It's beautifully laid out in Latin calligraphy and then illustrations all around it, including illuminations of Aquinas himself, the little flower, and Fulton Sheen. Uh, so anyway, it was just, it was a marvelous thing. I, I haven't gotten it yet. They're going to send it to me. But uh, it was just beautiful. But love that trip. It was a beautiful trip. A couple of years ago, back in 2020, you posted a YouTube video, which was a, a video of a talk that you gave titled, Ideas Have Consequences, The Philosophers Who Shaped Our Time. Now, this was a talk that you originally gave to the Knights of Malta. It was at their national yeah. conference. You were addressing this sort of convulsive time in our national history which was fueled by the global pandemic and unstable politics and outbursts of violence and unrest. Everyone watching this knows what we're talking about. But in that talk, you showed how the ideologies undergirding much of this unrest stem from four thinkers in particular. The four people were Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, and then Michel Foucault. You claimed that once we understand these four figures and some of their most basic ideas, will recognize their influence everywhere and will be better prepared to engage it. Now that talk, surprisingly, at least to me, ended up becoming one of your most popular talks of all time. And this gets back to something you said a couple episodes ago that yeah. it's not the small bite-sized chunks that tend to get all the attention. This talk was you know, nearly an hour long and it has 850,000 views. Almost a million people have sat down and watched this talk, which is staggering. And we haven't really followed up on it since then. So what I thought we yeah. could do is a series of discussions here on our podcast where we do a deeper dive into each one of these four figures. Um, so today we'll do Karl Marx, and then over the next few episodes, we'll do Nietzsche, Sartre, and Foucault. Yeah, let me just first say a word, Brandon, about what, what you just mentioned. Uh, I, I was astounded, too. I, I gave that talk. The Knights of Malta invited me. It was right at the height of COVID. I was supposed to go to New York and give that address in person. And I remember thinking... This is an important topic, but it's probably too heavy, you know, for the talk there. And maybe I've, you know, I've overshot it and this is not good. But then it was COVID. We decided, well, let's just do it on on uh, tape. And so if you had asked me, now, what do you think are likely to be, you know, the, the most popular talks this year? I would have ranked that like number, you know, 47. I, I would <laughs> never have guessed. But for some reason, maybe it was the time and people were interested in the deeper motivations behind what was going on in the culture. But it, it became, yeah, pretty wildly popular. So um, I am gratified by that. I think that's a, that's a positive thing. Let's start with the basics. Who was Karl Marx? Before getting to his ideas, tell us what we should know about the man. 
Well, German philosopher born 1818, easy to remember, in the town of Trier in the western part of Germany, descended really on both sides of his family from long lines of rabbis. So he's a Jewish man and a very strong Jewish background. His dad became a Christian, but largely for just, you know, political reasons. Uh, Marx uh, studies philosophy as a young man, becomes a devotee of Hegel, as most people who were studying German philosophy at the time would have been. Hegel was the dominant figure. But then he becomes um, a radicalized Hegelian, what they call sometimes a left-wing Hegelian. And he comes under the influence of another left-wing Hegelian, namely Ludwig Feuerbach, who's the father of modern atheism. We've talked a lot about him. Religion is a kind of idealized self-understanding projected outward as a fantastic supreme being, etc. And so Marx would have bought into that very deeply, but then Marx asked a follow-up question, which is, well, then why did we do this? Why would we do such a crazy thing and invent the supreme being? And from that comes a lot of his social theorizing. He operates for a time in um, Germany and in France and in Belgium, gets expelled because of his radical politics, ends up finally in London and spent the rest of his life in London. Uh, living not happily, Marx was not a happy person, lived um, in kind of borderline poverty. His friend Friedrich Engels, you hear about Marx and Engels. Engels was a uh, much wealthier man and he kind of kept Marx going. Marx spent most of his time at the British Museum in London. You can still see the chair he sat in where he wrote uh, his big work called Das Kapital, right? Capital, an understanding of how capitalism works. Dies in 1884, I believe it is and is buried in Highgate Cemetery in, uh, in London. Um, he was only about 60, what, 64, I guess, when he died. Um, you know, a bit, I suppose, like um, a Van Gogh or something like that, who in his own lifetime uh, didn't see that much influence, but then after his death had such a monumentally massive impact and um, shaped, I mean, look, a lot of the 20th century and continues to shape people's minds today. So that's a bit about Marx. A lot of Marx's ideas, especially his uh, his communism, became in vogue in the late 20th century. And you might say it reached a high point in the 80s and 90s with the Soviet Union that seemed to be taking over much of the world. Um, but then after the collapse of many of these communist regimes, uh, many people became somewhat disenchanted with Marx and believed that his time had passed. However, Today, we're seeing a revival, and I'm thinking especially among my peers and my generation, millennials, even younger than me, Generation Z, there seems to become, there seems to be a, a renewed fascination with socialism, Marxism, Karl Marx's writings uh, in particular. Have you seen this too? Have you noticed this? Oh, yeah. And it's an interesting thing to trace, Brandon. Go back to, you know, before my time, go back to the 20s, 30s, 40s, a lot of Western intellectuals were um, taken in by Marx. Uh, so, Think of in France and Germany and in England and in our country. Um, and then even in the wake of, of the Second World War, there still would be a lot of uh, interest among left-wing intellectuals in, in Marx. I think when the truth about Stalin became clearer and clearer, a lot of that fell away. You'll go back to the 1940s. I mean, some leading people in the West were still great devotees of Joseph Stalin. They thought he was the, you know, the, the coming thing. And then when it became clear how absolutely brutal his dictatorship was. And then Maoist China, when it became clear how absolutely barbarically brutal it was. Um, and then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, so that happened in 89 and the years after, I think a lot of people said this is both a morally and politically bankrupt system. But then you're right, um, today, I think a lot of younger people who don't remember those moments or they're not clear in their minds, are experiencing this revival. Look at Bernie Sanders and, and the sort of radicalization of the Democratic Party that's happened just in recent years. When Bernie Sanders first emerged, what, a couple election cycles ago, people thought, well, this is crazy, this, you know, wild-haired socialist from, you know. But yet, he appealed to a lot of young people. Um, to my mind, inexplicably, uh, I who've lived through a lot of this, um, of the period when the negative side of communism became unmistakably clear. And, uh, you know, the thought of Marx, though you can't entirely blame Joseph Stalin on Karl Marx, um, certainly there are elements in, in Marx's thought that gave rise to the very oppressive forms of communism that we have seen. So I, I have very little sympathy for that revival of interest in Marx, though I, you know, I, I get it. Let's 
turn to his economic and social theory in a moment, but first I want to begin with his religious views. So you mentioned uh, a few moments ago the name Ludwig Feuerbach, who massively influenced Marx's atheism. Uh, how so? How did Feuerbach shape Marx's views toward God? Well, he thought Feuerbach was basically right in his in his projection theory. Uh, someone like Sigmund Freud, early 20th century, thought Feuerbach was right when Freud says religion's a waking dream. So it's a wish-fulfilling fantasy. And Brandon, we know that, like in apologetic debates today, you hear that a lot. Oh, religion is, sure, I wish I would live forever. I wish there was universal justice. I wish there was an all-powerful being who will save me. So, you know, I, I invent religion. That's the Feuerbach theory. So Marx took that as basic, and one of his famous lines is, we must all pass through the Feuerbach, which in German means the fire brook, the brook of fire. So we have to be baptized, so to speak, in Feuerbach. So that's the opening move. He'll often say, too, that the first critique of any society is the religious critique, that we have to break through uh, the distortions of religion. But then, see, as I said, he pushed it. So why do we do this? There, there's this weird thing that we've done from time immemorial. We human beings have invented this fantastic supreme being. Why would we do that? His answer was because we're so unhappy in our economic life. And see, for him, he was a reductionist par excellence. Uh, human life comes down to economics. It's how we organize our lives economically is, is who we are. If I'm miserable in my economic life, I've got to invent some kind of um, drug that will dull the pain. Hence this famous line, religion is the opium of the masses, right? And that's what he meant. Uh, at a time, as it's an apt metaphor for him, at a time in London when opium dens were becoming uh, the thing, so opium was becoming more available in the West and people were becoming addicted to it and, and spending their whole lives lost in this, in this drug-induced fantasy. Marx said, ah, that's it. That's what religion is. It's the opium of the masses. It's the drug that's taken by people who are so unhappy in their economic lives. So that led him then to the next step, which was, okay, well, what's the problem with our economic lives? His answer was capitalism, which is a deeply oppressive and alienating system. What's the answer? Something like a revolution, a class struggle leading to a revolution that will put an end to capitalism. And then see, religion will fade away. He didn't think religion had to be sort of fought head on. He thought, get at it by uh, addressing the economic issue. And then once the, the pain of this oppressive system goes away, well, then there's no need for the opium. Let's talk about his criticisms of capitalism. What did what did Marx yeah. see wrong with capitalism? Pretty much everything. Um, now, mind you, Marx is writing mid nineteenth century, the time of like Charles Dickens. Think of Dickens novels that put a great stress on on the degrading conditions in factories and, and in these sort of collective uh, places and. Um, there no child labor laws, no minimum wage requirements, no limits to the workday. Um, that no unionization. Think of all the reforms that have come into place that we take for granted, which are limitations on a pure, you know, untrammeled capitalism, where the only thing that matters is, is uh, profit making. And, you know, human beings, who cares what happens to them? So Marx, to be fair to him, was, was reflecting on that kind of totally unshackled uh, capitalism. He felt that it was a violation of what he called our species being. That's his Germanic way of saying who we are meant to be, that we're meant to be free, we're meant to be artistic, we're meant to be uh, communal, we're meant to um, see ourselves in what we make and exult in it. But what happens in capitalism is all those things are undermined. I'm now ripped away from my connection to nature. I'm now placed in this very unnatural, unhealthy environment. I'm now cut off from my fellow human beings. I'm in a, sort of a, a cutthroat competition with them. I see myself in my work, but I see myself as alienated in my work. And so capitalism, he felt, was a violation of my essential being. So that word entfremdung in his German, the alienation, he got that from Hegel, becomes a basic Marxist theme. I'm alienated from my best self. And so I got to overcome alienation. And that's what leads to the um, to the revolution. Let's continue on that very thread. He he believed that the response to this corrupt corrupt economic system was to heal it through class struggle, or namely yeah. revolution. Uh, what did that look like to Marx? What did he have in mind? 
Right, he didn't think capitalism was reformable. Now, you know, to be fair, I, I want to bring some nuance to it. He felt capitalism was like the best system we've had so far. So go back to, you know, a slave economy in the ancient world. Go back to a feudalistic economy in the Middle Ages. Go back to early forms of capitalism. He thought the capitalism of his own time was the best we've done so far. So he's Hegelian in that sense that history is moving forward, right? But it always happens through a violent struggle. That's a, his reading of Hegel. But Marx felt that, you know, it's the best we got, but it's still pretty lousy. So what do we do? We should foment a class struggle, that you have a, a ruling class, uh, the owners of the means of production, the, those who control the economic and political and cultural life of the society, and they're keeping down the masses of the ordinary workers. And so he thought the proletariat, which would be the industrialized working class, would be the sort of tip of the spear of the revolution. By revolutionizing them, they would lead this uh, uprising. He thought it would happen in the big cities. Uh, Marx didn't see it happening in a place like Russia. That's one of the ironies. He would have seen it in Berlin and London and Paris, right? New York, maybe, but not in, in Moscow. <laughs> um, anyway, he thought th this revolution would, would start in the great cities and would lead then to the overthrow of the ruling class and the emergence of a classless society. So Marx didn't want, well, let's get rid of those guys and put the other ones up on top. He wanted ultimately a classless society where there were no stratifications and hierarchies. Everybody held things in common, hence communism, right? Um, we've overcome these fundamental forms of alienation. We're back in touch with nature. We're back in touch with each other. Uh, we see ourselves in our work, but we see what's beautiful and good in ourselves. That's the utopian dream that Marx had about what would happen after the revolution when pure classless communism would obtain. I think when we look through history, especially over the last, say, 50, 75 years, it becomes clear that this revolution naturally involves violence. Um, and it seems that in Marx, violence isn't just a, a regrettable side effect of the revolution, but it's the point of the revolution. That without violent struggle, this utopia will never arrive and the exploitation will never end. Do you think that that this partly explains the uptick in and violent protests and demonstrations today in our own time that we can trace that back to Marxist ideas? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot we can say about Marx. I'm laying out his theory and every bit of which can be criticized and should be criticized. But especially on this point, Marx following Hegel has a basically antagonistic social theory. So remember Hegel with thesis, antithesis or antithesis, and then synthesis that happens through a kind of conflict of the two. So that's the movement of ideas in Hegel, but also the movement of history. You've got one uh, point of view, the opposite point of view, they clash, and then a new synthesis emerges. But it's basically a violent account, which is why Hegel, I've cited this a couple times, says history is a slaughter bench. Now, it's, we talked about the Book of Judges a couple weeks ago. It's hard to deny that in a way that, I mean, history is the story of constant uh, struggle. But Marx said, okay, that's the way it goes. And so what I want to do, he said, is foment class struggle. I, I don't want to cover it up or try to make it better or say we can find a way forward altogether. He wanted to foment a class struggle. That was the role, by the way, of the Marxist intellectual was to raise consciousness about the situation and, and uh, radicalize the proletariat so that they would commence the revolution. Um, the antagonism of the social theory on offer today, I think we see within wokeism, is very much a, a descendant of this Hegelian Marxist view. Um, trying to find a healing way forward, that's not in the Marxist sort of lexicon. It's let's foment revolution, which necessarily is violent. Uh, look at Lenin, a faithful disciple of Marx here. You got to, you know, break a few eggs to make an omelet. So that's just the way it goes. Uh, that, I would suggest, is repugnant to Catholic social teaching, which is based upon a non-antagonistic social theory. Marx has been described as a master of suspicion um, because yeah. he, he encourages the constant unmasking and dismantling of right. the cultural superstructure, to use his language. Right. That's key to getting the revolution underway. Do you think that Marx lurks behind a lot of today's suspicious and cynical attitudes, especially toward government, politics, the church, other institutions? Yeah. It seems a, a massive rise in cynicism and skepticism around those things. Absolutely. And you use that term, which is really right. Um, 
substructure superstructure was a basic idea in Marx. The substructure of any society, he felt, was the economic core. So again, it all comes down to economics. The whole point of a society is to cultivate and make possible that economic core. So what it does, it throws up around itself a protective shell, if you want. Call it the superstructure. And it includes everything else. So everything else in society, the arts, uh, politics, uh, science, religion, philosophy, uh, all of it is part of the superstructure whose whole purpose is to protect the economic substructure. So a big part of the Marxist intellectual move and revolutionary move is to break down the superstructure, break through it, let people see what's really going on. Uh, I, I think during the talk I use that comparison with the, the Wizard of Oz because there's a lot of interesting overtones there, uh, Marxist overtones. But one of them is pulling back the curtain, right, on the guy that's just manipulating. So there's the mighty, powerful Oz, but it's just this little creepy guy behind the curtain who's manipulating. And it's the dog who pulls back the curtain to reveal what's really going on. That's sort of a Marxist idea of breaking, th look at the superstructure, it's so awesome, look at the mighty, powerful Oz, oh. But when I break through that, I see it's just protecting a grubby little substructure over here. Um, and so to answer your question, yes, today I think in a lot of the woke stuff, you'll find that is a deep suspicion of all the institutions of society, that they're just part of a superstructure protecting some kind of grimy substructure. Now, the Marxist thing was economics for sure, that's Marx, but it's taken different forms in, in some of the people today. So for many, it's racism, it's the racial struggle the oppressors and the oppressed, not so much economically, but racially. And so now just play the Marxist game. That's the substructure, and around it is the whole superstructure that protects this racist core. Look at the 1619 Project, right? The, the whole American political arrangement is just an elaborate way to protect um, slavery. Uh, that's a typically Marxist way of thinking. And, you know, <laughs> there's many problems with it, but one is just the sheer reductionism of it. Whenever you say a society is all about X, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, societies are just, they're richly complex and all these things have different roles to play and they're both good and bad and so on. But I think that style of thinking, which you see today is, is very Marxist, yeah. Well, let's close with this. Uh, what do you think Marx gets right? And then on the other hand, what, what in Marxism should we resist? Yeah, I mean, what he gets right is, is, um, is biblical. As I say, Marx is descended from a long line of rabbis, and there's a lot of the Old Testament prophet in Marx. That is to say, someone who is, who is righteously indignant at deep injustice. And I say, hooray for Karl Marx. I mean, yeah, there was plenty wrong in mid-19th century Europe, especially in uh, Germany, France, and England. There was plenty wrong with these very early forms of, of uh, undisciplined capitalism. And was Marx right to raise his voice and protest against it? Sure, yeah. Read the early Marx. Um, the work th that I uh, did my master's work on is called The Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. The very young Karl Marx writes these. And they, there's something of the romanticism of that time, but also I think the Hebrew uh, prophets come through of just a deep indignation about injustice and a desire to do something about it. Now. His diagnosis of the problem and his proposal of a solution, I would have very serious problems with. But that he had a righteous indignation about injustice, sure, I'm all for that. And I think when people are attracted to Marx, that's what they're attracted to, is that sense of, yeah, there's something wrong here that needs to be righted. There he's like Amos and he's like Isaiah and he's like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Um, so that part of Marx, I think, is, is right. Um, you know, where's he substantially wrong about God, certainly, so the, the critique of, of, um, of religion is obviously wrong. I think substructure, superstructure is a very reductionistic, simplistic way to think about society. And I think his view of capitalism as a fundamentally antagonistic sort of social theory, that's the wrong way to think about it. Uh, I think the market economy, and I'm following Catholic social teaching here, is, is morally praiseworthy. But it needs to be circumscribed, legally and morally. And if you want, there's a nod to Karl Marx. Sure, I, I, I'm not in favor of untrammeled, uh, unshackled capitalism. Just off you go and make profits at anyone's expense. No, 
I like child labor laws. I like minimum wage requirements. I like the limitations on the workday. I like unionization. I like the government monitoring the capitalist economy. Sure. And I like vigorous religion that brings to bear a concern for justice, a concern for the poor, that it's not all about profit making. It's about love and so on. Yes, I want the market circumscribed in all these ways. So in that measure, sure, I'm, I'm in favor of, uh, of, of Marx, if you want to put it that way. But the way he proposed the, the destruction of capitalism, and um, especially through an antagonistic revolutionary social theory, that I would strenuously disagree with. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. Every episode of the Word on Fire show, we take one question from listeners like you. If you have one, you can send it to us at the website askbishopbaron.com. Today, we have a question from Luke in Canada, and he's asking about discernment. Here's his question. Hello, Bishop Barron. My name is Luke. I live in Western Canada. I'm wondering about the permanent diaconate and what advice you would give to a man who's discerning this as a possible vocation. Thank you very much. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. First, I mean, take the call seriously. If you feel that call, don't ignore it. Take it seriously. And I'd say to you what I say to, to someone discerning the priesthood, which is try to get to Mass every day, try to do a holy hour every day if you can, uh, bring that question stubbornly before the Lord. Okay, Lord, what, what do you want? Listen to people around you. Um, what are people who know you? What do they say? Do they say, hey, you'd be a great deacon. I, I know a lot of, of Catholic lay people that I've said, yeah, I think you'd be a wonderful deacon. I've noticed, you know, skills you have and all that. So pay attention to that. But I'd say maybe above all this, um, I think a permanent deacon, I'm presuming you're, you're married and have kids, it's something that involves your, your family, uh, especially your wife. And so discern with her and discern with your kids. It can't just be a individual decision you're making, but it involves the whole family. So I get them involved too. But I've known some marvelous uh, permanent deacons over the years, including my own deacon, Chris Sander, who's been such a wonderful assistant to me all these years. And, and his, his wife's a great lady. And the two of them discern their, their ministry together. So I, I guess I'd emphasize that especially. I have a couple of really close friends down here in Orlando, Mike Bradica, Jason Bullman. They're both being ordained deacons yeah. in a couple weeks here. We're right in the in the season. Um, yeah. But one thing I've learned through their experiences is how most dioceses, our diocese at least in Orlando, and I think many others, uh, require or at least strongly encourage the wives to join yeah. the husbands the in the formation. They have to go through yeah. all the classes, the five-year yeah. training, the retreats, everything. So it is a joint communal decision. It's yeah. not just the husband wanting to do this against the wife's wishes. I've always thought that was really wise. Yeah, me too. Well, thanks so much for watching and listening to this discussion of Karl Marx. Um, again, I hope this is uh, enlightening and helpful to understand the present moment. We're going to have three more of these discussions coming soon, one on Frederick Nietzsche, one on Jean-Paul Sartre, and one on Michel Foucault. So look forward to that. Also, look forward to Word on Fire's newest book. Um, it's titled Redeeming the Time, Gospel Perspectives on the Challenges of the Hour, and it's written by Bishop Barron. Um, this book follows in the path of two of his previous ones, Seeds of the Word and Vibrant Paradoxes, which are all collections of essays commenting on cultural topics of the day. Um, this one, though, I think is especially good for now because it reminds us that even when things around us seem hopeless, there's always hope, specifically found in Christ and his church. Um, Bishop, I know you just got a copy of this in the mail. Did you want to say yeah. a word about it? Just, yeah, as you say, a collection of essays I've written over the years. Uh, these are probably a little more about things that are troubling in the culture. and, and um, But as you say, the ultimate purpose is always one of hope and to bring the gospel to bear on these things. So they're kind of short nuggets. I think when people have responded in the past to these books, they say, I, I like that I can read you know, one of these essays, they're only maybe, what, 900 words a piece. I, I write them for my, my weekly column. So um, I think they're easy to read in that sense. Um, but I hope it's, it's chunky enough and rich enough to satisfy you too. So pick it up. Again, it's called Redeeming the Time. I will include a link in the show notes for this podcast episode. Good. Well, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Mm -hmm.